Good evening and welcome to the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamantung Kumalo. Today is the 20th episode of the Private Property Podcast, and we are on day 43 of the national lockdown. And it's Friday. I know a lot of us probably thought that this Friday came on way too quickly. And as promised, every second Friday, we're going to be profiling different people about their property journey. And on this evening's episode, I'll be speaking to Tina Makovela, who has done an amazing job in growing her property. She's in the student accommodation space and we'll be finding out some tips and tricks that she's learned along the way and really want to know how she did it. Good evening, Tina. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and um, good evening to everyone um, who's tuned in. I think before we even go, you know, to property, because sometimes people think maybe you need to be very rich or come from a, a really good family to be able to afford property or to get your foot into the property uh, ladder. Maybe if you can tell our viewers at home just a little bit about you, um, just so we get a sense of where your starting point essentially would have been on your property journey. Um, so I born and bred in Port Elizabeth, um, raised by... Um, pretty wonderful woman who also puts babies for a living. Um, so I don't come from a rich background um, and really um, in terms of wealth building, um, I started from scratch. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm born and bred in PE um, and I'm currently based in Grandstown. I'm an academic by profession, um, but also run um, property business. And I think let's actually then go to that property business. I mean, and I know that that's not the only business that you run and we'll go into um, the other one just a little bit, but perhaps if you can share with us how you actually got started in property and what, what made you even go uh, the property route instead of any other business ventures that are out there. Um, so I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family. As I said, um, my mother, my aunt, my grandmother, all of them um, sold fruits and veggies and um, my mom and my aunt still do. So mm. I grew up in, in an environment that um, entrepreneurship was, you know, the norm. Um, and I grew up being involved in that business. I usually um, joke to my students that I learned um, not to use a calculator um, quite a lot from just, you know, um, helping around in that business. Yeah. So I think entrepreneurship is something that I learned at a very young age. So I'm the kind of person that I think um, um, I find it quite easy to, you know, um, think of a business idea and, and just run with it because of that. So how I got into property, um, I basically was um, a new graduate who wanted to buy a home for her family. So that was the first property I bought. Um, it was not um, to you know, um, invest in property in the sense of a business, but rather a family home. Um, and then I fell in love through that general, I enjoyed viewing properties. I enjoyed, you know, spending time on <laughs> property 24, looking at houses I couldn't afford. I think then um, the first property I bought, then um, sort of, um, uh, um, that's the one that sort of, um, what's the word? That's when the bug hit. Is that what yeah, is, is that's that when the property you... bug essentially hit you. Yeah. <laughs> So yes, yeah. So that's 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 when things started, and yeah, um, it started with being that house and learning from you know that process, and then um, and then I and then further after buying that house, I bought a second property, and that was mainly because um, I was tired of renting. Um, so that was the second reason why I got into um, pro well, the first reason I got into property as a business was mm. because a young professional who was tired of renting and I wanted alternatives to, to renting. And I mean, let's go perhaps to, to, to the first property, which is the family home. Uh, I mean, did you, for example, um, find even that process easy? I think a lot of us, um, let's say you're young professionals and you have a dream of buying, uh, you know, your family, their dream home, or sometimes even upgrading their current home. It's always one of those things that we want to be able to take off um, because it's quite a big deal, I think, in our community to be able to do that. How was that process? Because I mean, I can imagine how daunting it is. You already start working and instead of looking for your own place, the, the first thing is let's actually first make sure that a family home is um, you know, sorted and ticked off, then only can you start thinking about um, your own properties. 
so that process for me was a learning curve, I, I think. Um, it was a huge learning curve. I had just graduated with my master's. And I thought I could just go to the bank with my pay slip and say, hey, I, aim, I earn this much. Um, can you guys give me a bond? Uh, <laughs> and, and little did I know about things like building a credit score. I always grew up knowing that staying away from debt is the best thing ever. Um, and I didn't know that debt in this case, um, you know, um, getting some form of debt to sort of build a, a credit score was important. So um, as a result, even though I had, you know, proof that I'm fully employed, um, I've got the three months, stay, um, what do you call this, payslip, et cetera, yeah. the bank to, to trust me as, you know, um, someone they can fund because they don't have any um, evidence of how I handled it. Um, so that was a stumbling block. Um, so when I was planning to buy property, it was then delayed because they, they flat out, you know, rejected me because I did not have any form of a credit score. Um, so I then um, had to build my credit score. Um, and I and think how I'm did you do really that? So I, I think, Tina, how did you do that? Because I think a lot of people... Um, also come, we and a lot of us probably come from, you know, being raised by parents who did have debt and somewhere along the line, you just thought debt is a bad thing, is a bad thing, I must not have debt. And if you're fortunate enough to not take on debt when you start working, by the time you're thinking of, you know, buying a home, it's good that you haven't been able to have debt, but actually the bank doesn't quite view it like that. And so how did you end up, you know, resolving that and building that credit score for yourself? So I was I was advised by um, the lady who was sort of my bond originator and also um, the the you know um, the bank consultants who were busy with my um, application that I should open up you know clothing store um, um, accounts and you know um, credit um, um, cards and I was quite skeptical because for me I thought you know I've always known debt to be a bad bad thing mm -hmm. so. <laughs> quite difficult for them to sort of you know get me used to the fact that no this is you know to help you so I then decided to go for it in a very slow paced um, manner by taking on a credit card um, that I then managed to uh, make sure that I use and be able to pay within the interest free period yeah. um, and then I also on um, a phone contract. Um, they argued that the way I was going about it was going to build the credit score very slowly, but I prefer to go slow and learn with the process than going fast. And it was actually um, a blessing in disguise because in that period, I ended up buying the house two years later. In that mm. period, I managed to save about 40% um, of the deposit of that particular house that I would have you know, um, bought. Yeah. Bought with 100 bond so looking back it was really an advantage that i was rejected um by the banks and was able because what i then did was i knew how much i you know i was willing to spend to i have the bond have and yeah. um and put them but that money aside um, as you know savings um, for a deposit and all the other expenses you know um, such as you know um, the transfer fees etc. So yeah. um, that was quite, quite helpful. So I, I built it using a credit card and just a phone contract. Um, maybe I could have done it faster by taking multiple um, um, you know, accounts, et cetera, but I was not comfortable with some of the, you know, ways they were suggesting I do it. So I think slow in that case was actually better. And I think, you know, one thing that's uh, quite impressive is the fact that you were even able to be disciplined enough to put away the money that you would have been using for the property. Uh, I'm sure there are many of us who probably don't have that kind of discipline. Um, so being able to say, actually, this is still what I want. This is still the property that I want. and Perhaps for now, even though I know that it's not there, let me put away this money. And I know that, uh, you know, whether it's a year or two years down the line, I'll still be able to use it towards something that's actually a property. Now, you mentioned that the second property that you then obviously bought was because you were tired of renting um, and, you, and you ended up buying it. I actually want to understand what your 
what you know, like what kind of numbers you ran when you're kind of making a case? Because we've covered a few episodes right here on the Private Property Podcast where we look at sort of the pros and cons of renting versus buying. And, and in different instances, buying isn't always the, the best option, certainly not in the short run, but in others, in the long run, it might be better. So for you, what were some of the considerations when you sat down and kind of ran the numbers um, to see whether you can make a business case for yourself to buy instead of continue renting? Okay. So for me, I think I was coming from the school of thought that, you know, you'd rather, you'd rather pay this money of rent towards something that's yeah. yours. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, I've, I've learned to, you know, um, to sort of um, um, question that. Um, but yeah. uh, back then, I think my thinking was around, um, I am paying, so I live in Grahamstown, which is a small um, university town. So the town, um, the major aspect of the economy of the town is the university. So as a result, um, one of the things that, you know, um, is a disadvantage, but also an advantage is that it ends up being a, um, a high, um, you know, um, it ends up being there's a lot of demand in terms of um, rental uh, rental spaces because people are coming as young professionals. They don't want to commit to buying property, so they're renting. Um, there's lots of students in town who want, you know, a temporary space. So there is a huge rental market um, in, in town. And as a result, and because the town is, I I think the property market is still in the hands of a few. Um, so it's, uh, I, I usually say it's, it's a very, um, it's a monopoly town, <laughs> um, yeah. especially in the market. So the prices of renting are quite expensive. So for me, I was, you know, um, I then questioned myself in terms of how much money I'm paying towards rent. Um, and then try to understand if I were to buy, what would the implications be? Um, and whether um, the money that I was paying towards um, um, renting would would it be sufficient to um, you know pay a bond and you know um, you know um, work towards a, as, as a, um, work towards a, an investment for myself? But I then realized that because the property prices are so expensive, there was no way I would buy a property and be able to take the money that I was spending towards rent, um, and it will just be purely it um, in terms of covering all the expenses that are involved in buying a property. So I then had to rethink my strategy. Um, um, because of the way the town is set up, most of the houses in town, um, um, so you'd have a main house in the yard, but there will always be um, a cottage or apartment yeah. that is standalone in the same yard or same earth um, that is um, usually used as the, so the main family will stay in the big house and then the, the, the back property will then be used by a young professional like myself back in the day or um, by a student, a postgraduate student. So all the houses are sort of set up like that, um, yeah. most of them in town. And then you also have complexes. I was not interested in buying complex, um, in, um, an apartment because um, my thing was if I buy an apartment and I want to, because I, I was looking basically for a dual um, property, so a dual purpose property, one that I can live in, but also at the same time be able to generate some income from it. Um, and majority of that income should be able to um, to um, to cover the bond on my behalf and then I top it up if I have to. So that was sort of the, the thinking process that I had. So with apartments, I thought because of the way they set up, it's a two bedroom or three bedroom, you then have to share space with someone. Mm -hmm. So I then went for a standalone because it gave me the ability to have one part of the property to myself and one part of the property to whoever is renting out. Um, and most of the time, it's usually um, families who live in the main house and then they'll rent out to supplement their, um, you know, their bond or their, their income um, by yeah. young professionals. And for me, I actually flipped it around. I wanted the main house to be rented out because that's where the major um, income would be coming from. And then I would live in, you know, as the person who's sort of renting um, in, in, um, 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 in, 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 in senses where, in cases where families are owning the house. So I lived in the back property. Um, and then um, I, I wanted to live in the back property and then have the main property as a digs for students. So I was looking for a three bedroom, four bedroom. 
Um, and in this side, three bedroom, four bedroom, um, you can rent out to students and each student will have their own room and mm. you charge around 3,400, um, 4,000, sorry, 3,000 to 4,000 per room. Um, and I wanted that to be the main, um, where most of the money is coming from. And then I supplement if I have to. So when I was running the numbers, I wanted to ensure that actually the main house should, should, should pay all the expenses of the property yeah. that includes bond um, expenses and have some profit on top. Um, and not, you know, um, have to supplement it. So that was sort of my thinking is that I wanted a dual purpose property um, and I was not ready to have that property to myself. It, it wouldn't ha have made sense to buy such a big property for just for me and not be able to generate money out of it. And I think, you know, I want us to take a quick break. When you come back, um, Tina, when you mentioned that essentially this is a township digs. I mean, you, you find yourself in Gravesham or now in Makanda and you see that there's a gap um, in the market, some of the properties might be maybe closer to um, the university. This one is more of a township digs. The nice thing about, you know, uh, Makanda is that it's not as massive, for example, as Joburg, where uh, a township could be substantially further from where the university actually is. So I'd, I'd like us to probably look at, you know, how you then go out and even look at look for some of those tenants um, and really build that student accommodation business because you've now essentially decided you're going to live in the back cottage. The main house is what the student accommodation business is going to be run from. Then you get another property and you kind of run the same model. Um, and I, I really wanted to, to be able to even get a few nuggets around what you learned along the way. Because I think we sometimes look at student accommodation as you need to have a lot of money for a startup cost or you won't be able to maximize your money if you just buy that one house. So perhaps for our viewers at home who want to get into uh, student accommodation, to essentially just give them some tips to help them should they want to get into student accommodation. We'll be back just after this with Tina Makovela. We're going to be looking at, or rather we're talking about, you know, how to get into student accommodation before 30. She did it, she, she just recently turned 30. So when she did all of these things that she's talking about, she was already under 30 while managing a job and ensuring that she essentially runs her property like a business and oftentimes we do talk about the importance of certainly when you're doing rental properties to run it like a business from the get-go because you're able to be professional about it you're able to also get the necessary tax benefits um if you're doing it like that from scratch so we'll be back just after this with tina Welcome back to the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamanto Nwakumalo. I'm on the line with Tina Makovelo, who is a property entrepreneur. She's also an academic. And tonight we're talking to her about her journey into student accommodation. If you've ever been interested in getting your foot into the student accommodation ladder and don't know how to do it, especially if you're a young professional, you're under the age of 30, this is the show for you. Now, Tina, you know, before the break, you were sharing with us some of the, how you actually got to getting the first two properties. So the first was for the family. So really the first investment property or the first digs um, was the one where you end up, I think, staying at the back and you wanted to make sure that the main house can essentially cover all the expenses and you're able to make a profit. From having done that, how did you then go and say, actually, I think I can get another one? Um, and how did you navigate that decision? Because I know you, you did add others, you know, and, and I'm sure you've got ambitions of, you know, growing that portfolio as aggressively as possible, because you've certainly for you found a sweet spot within the Makanda region and want to be able to grow on it as much as possible. Maybe even, I think later on, we'll even talk about diversifying. I mean, I think a lot of us uh, landlords, especially to students right now are going through quite a lot. When you look at the effects of COVID, students are not at home. So I think we'll talk a little bit about diversifying your portfolio so that it's not heavily reliant on the student market sector. So how did you then go from having that first, um, we'll say investment property, and then adding the, the, the other one? Okay, so just before I go on to adding, I just want to, um, so the second property, which is the first investment property was not in the township, so it was in town. Okay. Um, so um, with that, obviously I wanted a place to live in um, and then also be able to you know, um, generate income from it. So I, I moved um, from looking at it as, um, as a digs for students and um, actually considered running a hostel out of it. 
So I then sat down and, you know, <laughs> um, because I'm very passionate about education, I then sat down and, and looked at how do I um, look at my property business model as not just, you know, a landlord um, tenant um, kind of scenario, but how do I, you know, um, re envision what I see as, you know, um, as the property business. So what I then did was to look at the reason why I was interested in particular with, um, with the hostel um, um, business model as a property model was because my sister was in town um, as a high school learner. And she had stayed in one of the hostels in the local schools. And I was realizing how much money I was paying into, you know, her staying in those hostels and maybe some of the gaps that exist um, in current hostel models and how I can, as an educator, create a space that is, um, you know, um, a bit different to what is offered out there. So the, 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 the second house then ended up being um, a fully fledged hostel that houses about eight learners from different high schools, um, instead of it being a digs where students, you know, um, do as, as uh, manage the property on their own and do as they, you know, as they please, but rather um, have, um, you know, um, um, learners that need more, more care um, in terms of, there's, you know, in, in the pricing model, there is electricity, there is, so everything has to be covered in the fees. So it wasn't just a matter of how do I cover the bond, but also how do I cover the running expenses of, you know, this bigger business of running a hostel. Um, so that's what it ended up being, um, um, the second property. Um, and then to go to the, your question about how I then decided to go into um, um, investing more um, in the latest property, um, I was noticing that um, the university student um, um, demographics are changing quite drastically. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, um, um, in terms of class, in terms of where students are coming from. Um, um, and I was noticing that most students, particularly the NSFAS funded students, are not able to afford to stay in town. As I said to you earlier, um, rentals in town start from 3,000 to about 5,000 um, uh, per room or, or rather um, per student. Um, and they get about 4,500 4, a month to cover their, um, you know, um, living costs, which include rent, but also meals, et cetera. So I was finding that um, students are struggling in town to get decent accommodation at their budget of 4.5. That's when then I then um, ventured into um, township, into a township dig. So the last property was the township digs. Um, and really um, it was, you know, the decision was mainly because of the challenges I saw students facing in terms of finding decent accommodation in town. Um, and then also on my side, thinking as an investor, um, if I were to invest in a property, it makes sense for me to invest in the township because number one, I know the township. Uh, number two, the students I'm looking at also know and are comfortable with the township. But what was missing in the market is um, a, an environment that is conducive and you know a, a, and is catered for a student. So most of them were staying in you know random uh, back rooms, um, you know that weren't suitable for a student. Not furnished, not um, you know um, um, in, um, con um, conducive to them studying. So the the, the township digs then came from a point of view of wanting to create um, affordable student accommodation but that also makes sense in terms of on a business point of view. And I think one of, I mean, I like the, the what you mentioned around when you look at um, township accommodation, especially township student accommodation, even when you look at, you know, Joburg, where we've got the University of Johannesburg, that's got a campus um, in the township, there's still quite a, a bit of room to ensure that the, the quality of the accommodation that students are able to get um, in Soweto and in the areas that are very close to UJ are of the same yeah. level if they choose, for example, not to stay in a university residence. And of course, we know there are limited beds. Then the students, for example, who are placed um, in the APK campus where they have, um, you know, the, the locations that they would essentially have access to are your Auckland Park, so your Malvilles. So we typically yeah. find that the quality of some of the student accommodation in certain areas isn't as good as in other areas. And there really right. is no reason why those students shouldn't also be able to get, you know, um, fully furnished apartments. Um, and of course, you're able to sort of budget that into the model. Um, and often, I mean, I know I'm in the student accommodation here in Joburg, 
you sometimes struggle if your place isn't fully furnished. You almost as a standard, it's a given. So it's not even a thing where you'd say, if it's empty, it's going to be 4,000. If it's furnished, it's going right. to be 5,000. Students expect that you furnish their apartment. <laughs> sometimes they even expect that you have unkept, you know, fiber with some of them. I mean, depending which area, of course, um, that right. you in. So I think then, Tina, because I, I want to take in a few questions and comments from our viewers at home, and I see that we've got quite a few coming in. Um, before I squeeze in a few of my other questions, I'm going to ask some of theirs. Um, the first okay. one is coming in from um, Bruno, and Bruno asks, um, is student accommodation investment less, the same, or more lucrative than normal home investment? What happens with payments when students go home for holidays and how different is the lease agreement? Example, an apartment in Stellenbosch, in Stellenbosch not necessarily a home with a granny flat. So I think let's probably start with the first bit of the question around, you know, is it the less, the same or more lucrative than normal home investment? I think this would um, also touch, um, sorry, okay. So, I mean, I think both, um, each have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, in terms of home, um, as as the, the 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 viewer is asking um, or mentioning that you you if you are renting out to Tina, who's a professional, um, she's more likely needing to be in Gramstown from January up until December. You know, um, in terms of her work commitment, so you do have that as an advantage. But I think you can work it into your model as for student accommodation um, that you price such that the as much as the, the the leases might run from let's say January up until November, you price such that the December month is not stranded. Or rather it's not a month that doesn't have it won't have actual income, but the income will be factored into the other yeah. months. Yeah. So um there's ways around it. But um something else I wanted to mention, um, I think he's asking about holidays when students are on holiday that's covered in their rent so it's their choice to go home or not go home um so the lease agreement um um is not um giving them a leeway um in terms of you know um not paying rent in those months that they're not um in 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 the in the accommodation because remember students differ um there's undergraduate students but also postgrad students postgrad students are more likely to be staying the entire year including those holidays because they're working on their research etc so the lease uh, agreement is standard whether you're an undergrad or postgrad but in in some cases other people take advantage of the fact that you've got the holidays um so for example in Gramstown, we've got um many activities during the holiday time that actually could give you extra income um if you were to you know um, um actually release the students from paying in those months so for example um um, my hostel, I can also use it as grad accommodation when there's graduations and those, you know, short term um, accommodation periods, they really um, bringing a chunk of money. Um, and in addition to graduation, we also have um, the Gramstown Arts Festival, which also brings in, you know, a lot of money. So there's also those months that you can, you know, activities that you can take advantage if you do have an agreement with the students that um, on holidays, just like with residences, you have to check out if it's holidays. Um, then you have that ability to bring in extra money um, through, you know, other um, avenues such as short-term accommodation during those periods. Um, so yeah, you factor you factor those months such as December into your calculation um, of the rentals. I think, um, but I've also noticed that students have also gotten smart. I re, um, when I moved to Gramstown. Um, it was quite um, a norm that um, um, leases would run from the end of November up until the end of November the next year, so essentially 12 months. But I think students are actually taking the upper hand now and saying, you know what, these places won't run out. I'll look for a place in January, end of January. So most of the students now don't bother themselves unless they really want a particular place. They don't bother themselves looking for a place in November. So that's something else that one has to then factor into their calculation that I might even get a tenant in January. Um, so um, sometimes people would lean towards postgrad students more than other undergraduates who start their year maybe mid um, February or so and obviously this differs from you know um, environment to environment 
and um, this is, has been my experience in Afghanistan that there's been a, a lot of move from students, you know, wanting to bank the December, January rent and only looking towards the end of January for signing up for a lease from February until November. So you as the landlord or rather the property um, a person will have to, you know, um, in your calculations, if you know, for example, this is, you spend X amount in terms of your expenses for this particular property from January until December, how do you then change that um, expense to a 10 month expense um, mm. to factor into those months so that you're not stranded? We've got another question coming in from uh, Howard Mugetzane, uh, who asks whether you bought the, the, the investment properties in your personal capacity or you bought them under a PTY. Um, so I went um, for personal and I'm actually in the process of um, questioning whether um, I should move um, them to um, a company or a trust and what the implications are of that because there's um, in restructuring obviously you have to consider the cost of the restructuring and whether it is a move that is um, you know, um, that is making sense for you and the business um, cost wise. Um, so I'm actually in the process of thinking through um, whether I should do that. But um, because I started investing, um, you know, um, using myself as an assurity um, with banks and everything, I started off investing in my name. And that's something that I'm trying to, to switch over now and, and have them under the, a company instead of um, my personal name. And I think a lot of us, uh, you know, make that, whether we call it an error or one of those mistakes that you essentially... <laughs> to make and learn along the way. I think a lot of us, when we started off, especially whether it's yeah. student accommodation or renting out to young professionals, we often bought the first few properties in our personal capacity. Right. And later you try to make a case whether to transfer them or use yeah. them. And the, the thing is, once they're quite, once they're a few, you end up deciding, maybe I won't transfer these ones. All the other ones are buy. Yeah, because so you have to be careful in terms of which ones. <laughs> yeah, because I think sometimes even the cost of the transfer can actually be quite yeah. substantial. I mean, when I think about it, you could easily need to budget, let's say, 50, 60K. That could be a deposit for another property. You can literally exactly. finance another property with that amount. Uh, so, Tina, before I let you go, I think any lessons that you'd like to share with our, uh, with our viewers at home that you haven't shared, like almost the the one thing that they should take away from your property journey, which is still relatively in the beginning stages, but already making, you know, milestones and finding different ways to tap into the student and not just varsity students, but also high school students in the area that you're in and making sure that you're able to take advantage of not only the sort of relatively long-term lease, so your 10, 11 or 12 month leases, but also the shorter term leases. So already we're seeing that there are different ways you can navigate a property um, in a student town. Um, and, and I mean, I actually hadn't thought of the, the graduation season. I'll probably do that because I know, especially <laughs> in the December period, December, January, where there might not be tenants, um, yeah. I'll probably put up some of the properties for, for an overnight or a weekend and do a nice package yeah. for students because they're close enough to the universities. So any lessons you'd like to share with our listeners for them to take away, especially when it comes to student accommodation? Um, I think um, one of the biggest things for me is um, take the business as a business seriously at the beginning. <laughs> um, so, you know, have the proper things in place, have leases in place, you know, um, get, the, get, get good advice. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I think I've, I've made in my journey and maybe still continue to make um, is around pricing. I price with my heart. <laughs> oh. I always ask. Tina afford this and I'm talking about Tina as a student you know yeah, and I forget yeah. that sometimes that not everyone comes from a background that's similar to mine um there's rich people out there <laughs> um, you know and there's people who can afford um so yeah. your mindset in terms of a business and also defining your market quite um clearly in terms of who are you serving so for example with the hostel because I serve both public school and also private school, that there's like a huge gap between the two markets, between public, what a public school parent might be able to afford and what a private school um, parent might be able to afford. 
just to give you an example, um, public school hostels in town are normally around 50K uh, uh, per annum. And then um, when you're looking at the private school market, you're looking at about 120 per annum. So to be able to uh, serve these two people who have a huge 70K gap between them, um, is a very difficult task to make. So for me, I had to, you know, divorce my heart from the pricing. Um, and I did that by involving other people who, you know, are not thinking about it um, from the point of view of, oh my God, will this person be able to afford this? Oh my God, but what happens to this person? Um, you know, involving um, friends who are accountants, you know, um, um, to, to help you, you know, justify your pricing so that you don't hit yourself um, at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, I think, our, I think about the business quite seriously quite early. That also might involve, um, for me, because I do student accommodation, but, but also um, um, accommodate learners, I had to think about what differentiates me um, from you know, the other um, properties around town, the other people who do similar things. Um, and for me, the niche or rather the differentiator has been um, student um, accommodation, but with the you know, um, academic excellence at, at the heart of it. So part of our hostel, for example, offers, we offer in, in the package of the, you know, of, of the fees, we offer um, um, academic tutoring, you know, um, and that attracts the parent to our model in terms of, oh, I'm not just sending my child to stay at this place to be safe and, you know, um, to have a holistic environment that is conducive to studying, but they also have a tutor on top of that. So also think about how do you take your own skills into the, the model and make sure that you differentiate yourself from the next person, I think is quite important. Um, yeah, and then before um, thinking about expanding, I also think that um, this is something I, I learned quite recently from my mentor, um, how to maximize or rather to, to maximize or to milk out what each property can do for you as it currently has, the ones you are actually own. So for example, I've recently, I'm working on converting um, my basement, um, which was non-existent into a storage space where I can use the garage as a tutoring space. So now I've got, you know, a, another business that can be up, that can be housed in this still same property um, and be able to generate more income from rental from that tutoring business instead of going to rent or buy a new property. Um, even with the township digs, I'm thinking of um, there's still space to build more instead of going to buy more. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to build flats there, bachelor flats there to make sure that the, the, the property as it is right now, it can give me more without going to, um, to take on um, a new uh, deal or to, to venture into a new, um, 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 you know, um, property deal. And I think that's so important. Um, Tina, thank you so much for sharing those lessons. So the takeaway is business like a business. So even from the first property, don't make the mistake that so many of us make, you know, buying the first couple of properties in your personal capacity and not being properly able to claim back from SARS some of the expenses that you're going to be incurring along the way. Then be flexible in your business model and use some of the skills um, in the business model as you run your property business, especially when you've got student accommodation. So if you've got an additional skill, in Tina's case, there's tutoring involved and ensuring that you're able to maximize that property to the best of your ability before you go out there and get additional loans. Tina, thank you so much for joining us this evening. You've been watching the Private Property Podcast. This was episode 20. We are back again next week, Monday, with more topics, more insights, and more experts who will be helping us navigate our property journey. I hope you're staying at home and staying safe. We'll be back again next week.